Great, thank you very much indeed for that. I think without me blathering on any more, I'll say <laughs> open this list up to questions because we haven't got too much time. Gentleman at the back there. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm interested in the things after the copyright's been done in, in the clinic and publish in the journal. Um, if you're doing self-archiving, how can you ensure that it's properly peer-reviewed if you don't want to actually take it to a journal and just want to uh, have open access straight away? Um, well, most of the open access repositories do include peer-reviewed uh, okay. material. And you can indicate there if it's been peer-reviewed, if it's in the process of being peer-reviewed, or uh, but lots of them do take material that uh, isn't peer-reviewed uh, and that will never be peer-reviewed and as long as it's indicated that that is the case, you can, you can do that. Um, uh, some, uh, more of them are trying to establish the system of peer-review, which is important if we're going to use green open access using repositories uh, to replace the certain version of gold open access that's currently being promoted by things like the Finch. But it's, you can still publish open access and make work available online um, in repositories. If that's what you want to do, you can, uh, you can do it in a variety of different ways. Isn't the whole point that you essentially need to have a mediator between the author uh, and the peer reviewer for it to really count as peer reviewed in the shape of an editor of some sort? Uh, it does. Uh, the, the question is who should be that editor? Uh, and um, what seems to be when people have problems in their departments about this, we're going to put this online and this isn't going to be authoritative anymore. People seem to forget that we are the people who act as those editors, uh, we're the people who act as those peer reviewers, so we can actually do this ourselves. It makes, sometimes it requires a little bit of organisation and working together, but it's not, you know, it's not very hard to establish an editorial board. Uh, from people all over the world, since we all communicate uh, online these days, so you can do that really easily uh, and quickly. It's not uh, very difficult to establish uh, a peer review process. I know people are going to be talking about open journal systems later. That manages your whole peer review process for you. Uh, so it will track uh, from the moment an article is submitted to where it is in that editorial peer review process. So this is uh, all perfectly uh, possible. Uh, why people are talking about this and why they feel it's important is because publishers are asking for a lot of money to act as a gatekeeping body. Uh, and they perform valuable services. Uh, no one's saying that, that they don't. The question is, uh, it's becoming a blocking me mechanism, the amount of money that they're charging, rather than enabling messaging. And we have to think uh, how much we want to carry on paying uh, that cost or having that cost put on our work and restricting its act access and readership or how much we want to devise uh, other means uh, of performing the editorial and peer review work, which is all perfectly possible, easily, cheaply, quickly, with open access and the tools that are out there. Hey. I speak here as a historian and I'm one of the things historian publishing. And I'm also speaking as someone who recently, well, this is the second talk on open access humanities publishing I've heard vaguely recently. I presume you know William Sinclair of Cambridge and his slightly different open access book publishing scheme. And I'm struck listening to you how much emphasis you've got on, on repackaging and recreating text rather than on using the traditional format of the humanities monograph. Sure. And I find, I find what you're saying highly inspiring in terms of, say, creating, creating teaching resources or helping me get that course reader sorted. Where I don't see it helping is, right now we're working on an academic culture which still values that monograph. Sure. And there, or until we change that cult, or should we change, if we do change that culture, we still got to deal with the fact that um, people want us to publish monographs. And I think what struck me about thinking about yours and William's talk is that you can clearly do you, you can do open access peer review even for books. You've got people on demand, you can set up editorial reports, just like you were saying. Where you've still got the problem is convincing other people sure. to take this seriously um, for you know, promotion purposes, job purposes. And I think the academic press is still on edge 
in terms of marketing and distribution. I'm not sure it's worth quite the cost if you don't, but they do still have an edge there in terms of their experience. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know um, Open Book publishes, it's come out of Cambridge, uh, run by Rupert Catty. Um, uh, so yes, and we kind of correspond and they, um, one of the interesting things about uh, open access presses is we're, uh, as digital culture is in a lot of times, we're non-rivalrous. So uh, we're not like commercial presses where we all have to compete for profits and we have to kind of enclose our texts. Uh, what we can do is we can share texts because this is what we're about. So they've just recently asked, you know, we've got this new publishing system, can we have your text to include in our publishing system? Uh, and of course they can. They didn't really need to ask because they're licensed under a certain uh, CC license that would enable them to do that, but they're friends and it was nice that they can do that. So when you're talking about conventional presses having better distribution means, uh, what I would say is by sharing this, and that was the second such press that asked if they could have our books in two weeks that we'd have. So what we've got is not just us as a press promoting our work, we've got a whole network of other presses that are quite happy and willing to promote our work and not just to the target audience where they think they can sell this work, which in the majority of uh, academic presses would be uh, the UK, US and Australia, they can be available uh, worldwide to anyone uh, that wants them. Uh, the, the other question that you're talking about is a question of strategy, um, and uh, so if, you, if we went back to the, the PowerPoint slide where you had most of our book series, most of our book series are just like that. They're just very uh, conventional, as I say. Most of the books that we do and that we've already published are uh, uh, the same as Open Book Publishers and the same as Williams and Clare's. They're kind of just straight. They look like books, you can print them off, you have them as PDF, they look exactly the same, you wouldn't know the difference. And we did that precisely for the reasons you're talking about. You need that strategy to try and win people over. However, we've been doing this for quite a long time, I've been doing that, I can't remember, I said about 16 years. Uh, and you know, when you're doing it, you start thinking, well, what else can we do with this medium? So we wanted to have some space where we could explore that. Because if we're going to solve this problem of open access, there isn't going to be one answer, or we're not going to arrive at a solution by everyone just leaping on one answer. What we need, and Maria Bond, who I, I quoted earlier, what she argues is, we need a, not, a lot of different publishing experiments. And only that way we'll kind of find out you know, which ones work and which ones don't work for us. So we want to have a little space. Now I've emphasised that today to you because, you know, I'm guessing those that have come here are already kind of self-selected, you're already a little bit interested in open access. So just to me, bang on and yet again about <coughs> open access, it's really, you know, it's, uh, I'm trying to give some sort of radical salute there. Uh, we should do this, yeah, I was trying to say, well look, no, we can we can push, we can, we can think about other things, it makes us uh, open up some other additional interesting questions. But you don't have to do that, I'm, I'm doing that, because that's what I'm interested in. I was relating it to the first part of the talk is, I kind of think that we have to probably start thinking about that. As I said, that I showed um, philosophical transactions. Most academic journals don't seem that much different. What do we think about that? Can we still act like you know, we're still in the late 17th century? We don't like in other parts of our life. How comes we're still doing this? What does that mean? How appropriate is that? Or do we have to think, you know, things are changing. We might have to think of changing the way we act as academics and philosophers. One of the things I really like about what you're doing is, is um, that you are a, the, the, there's obviously a, a change in media or a new media, and that at all other points in history has changed textual culture. So when script comes along, it changes oral culture. When print comes along, it changes scribal culture. Um, so the books that you're putting together you know, seem to be to, to to me to be doing what the medium is for, rather than. You're right, what we normally have is, is, is print media simply transferred, and that's all that I was talking about too. So, but, to pick up on a bit of Eileen's question, the, the problem that we have as academics is the ref, which still seems to be predicated despite what it says. Still predicated on print culture. So, while I love what you're doing, what, what are your thoughts and responses to how, how do we work with ref, which seems to me not to have fully caught up? 
with this? Uh, well, REF is slowly getting there, and there's all the talk about the, the next REF after 2014, that that will require open access. Uh, so it is kind of getting there. Um, also, you've got to remember that I work in a school of art and design. It's an old work in a school of art and design, but I do now. Uh, and one of the nice things that I like about working in a school of art and design is when I come up with these crazy things, they go, oh, okay, that sounds kind of interesting, yeah. all right. That's a bit like art, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and so, as far as what I'm doing, as far as this, this is great for the RAF. Um, there are other factors that we were talking about um, last night. Some of us were talking about uh, you publish open access, your work is, has more uh, dissemination, certainly. Uh, we won't get into the, the, the debate between the difference between dissemination and impact, but certainly you get a wider readership from a wider range of people. That's always taught me, even about some of that class. At the moment, yes, the majority of uh, REF panels would probably be looking for very conventional. Um, paper-centric texts. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the REF talks about um, that online publications should have the same status or there shouldn't be any discrimination. Mm -hmm. Most people, and I do a similar role as, as you're talking about with REF uh, in my institution, most people are very cautious mm -hmm. about that. Most people think, yeah, yeah, this is what we say on paper, yeah. but actually they yeah. won't. They will review the traditional journals. <laughs> and that is a problem for open access. Um, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Suber's got this uh, mentioned at a conference once. You know, we can all start a journal. We could, I can show you how to start a journal in an afternoon. And that isn't really very hard, uh, and it could be a brilliant journal. It could be fantastic quality. The problem is, you can start a quality journal in an afternoon, but you're not going to get prestige in an afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a lot longer. But that's why we started something like Open Humanities Press to try and build up that prestige to have an international board that people really in our area couldn't really argue with. And it has worked so when the Australian Research Council tried to rate their journals, uh, the Australian journals that we had, um, admitted it, the first, when they had a first run through and a first draft, they weren't rated very highly because they're electronic and they had that usual kind of prejudice. But then the editors wrote and said, but have you seen, we're part of OHP, have you seen who's on the editorial board, have you seen how all this works? Then they got an ear rating. Does kind of work. Very quick. Yeah, I did, my question wasn't just about the, the, the will REF regard it as prestigious or authoritative enough, but the really interesting bit about what you're doing, REF wants to know, you're a researcher, which bit of this is your idea, and okay, you okay. might have a co-author and then 50% yes. is your co-authors, but the really interesting thing about what you're doing, and you mentioned very briefly Creative Commons licenses, is you're kind of... Um, you know, you're working past that kind of print idea of intellectual copyright and, yeah. and authorship and the most exciting things that you're doing, you won't know who wrote what, you know, as different things get added in and yeah. it becomes like a medieval commonplace yeah. book. How do we attribute that to anybody as a researcher? And yet it may be a great piece of collaborative research made out of almost anonymous yeah. contributions. Yes. Uh, would I submit those pieces to the ref? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm kind of sometimes thinking uh, there is a... Uh, it's a piece I've, I've mentioned briefly, it's a piece I published uh, on piracy. Uh, and what I did with that is, or so wrote about piracy, but then I published it uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer pirate network. And then as soon as uh, someone downloaded it and seeded it on these networks, I destroyed my original copy. Yeah. So it's only out there as a pirate. Yeah. So I'm kind of thinking maybe I can submit that to the, the yeah. ref and, <laughs> and they have to go and steal this text. <laughs> to actually review it, and I could call it art because I'm working in an art school. Um, I don't know. It, but again, it's a question of strategy, how far you want to push it mm. institutionally. Mm. You know, not all of these things I would have to for the right. reference. Yeah. You know, we're all playing strategic. Yeah. Right. I think we'll just draw this to a close now, but if I could just go back to one thing that you said a few minutes ago, that are we doing anything different in some respects from the early, from the mid-17th century, the foundation of the Royal Society and its transactions? In one sense, things are still absolutely the same. What really counts, if you're going to get your ideas accepted, is if there's credibility there in terms of peer review. I mean, that's the one thing that was very, very central around that time. And uh, it's going to be really hard to break out of that. I think. But, Gary, thank you very much thank indeed you. for all your thoughts.